What's up, y'all? This is Chitty Bang, and I'm on the Renegade Millionaire Show, the podcast that profiles entrepreneurs, founders, and CEOs. Join us as we go one-on-one inside the hearts and minds of some of our generation's best and brightest. And now, introducing your host, my friend, Sun Group Wealth Partners Managing Director, CNBC and Forbes.com contributor, Winnie Sun. Hey everybody, it is Winnie Sun here, your host for the Renegade Millionaire Show. How you doing? Um, as you know, we are here once again in beautiful Southern California in our LA TuneIn studios talking to you. I'm Managing Director, Financial Advisor for Sun Group Wealth Partners, and you've probably seen my posts on Forbes, CNBC, and a couple other fun places. But I'm really excited to talk to you today. Hey, you know, I did a little research. Did you know? I just want to share this with you because I thought it was fascinating. You know, it's all about wine these days. And something that you may not know about wine, I didn't know. Did you know that the U.S. is the largest wine-consuming nation since 2010? Now, that's a lot of wine. And in fact, 2014 was the 22nd consecutive year of growth for U.S. wine sales. And so why are we talking about wine? Well, we should always be talking about wine, right? In fact, we should have a glass of wine right now. But I don't have one right now. I have a bottle of water, but I'm thinking wine. And that's because I have a really good friend that just called in. My friend today, we just met, but we're good friends now, is Tim McIrney. How are you, Tim? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely. So how's the weather over there today? It's nice. It's not wintertime, so it's nice. Beautiful and not not raining or snowing, so I'm happy. <laughs> love it, love it. So how's your, your day going? Because I know you pro- you're probably busy, right? Because this is, this, you, you, you are making wine like, or your, your team is making wine like crazy. Yeah, yeah, we're busy. We, we're showing up every day, working hard. We're, yeah, we produce quite a bit of wine, um, you know, outside of, uh, you know, the restaurants that we're operating. So yes, say, staying busy to say the least. Oh, wow. Well, let's talk about, let's talk about your past. I'd love for you to tell us your story and how you started in this industry. Sure. Well, I, um, you know, like a lot of restaurant and probably wine folk as well, I, I grew up working in restaurants. So when I was 11, 12 years old, I started working in a restaurant uh, in the Chicagoland area and, and was washing dishes. And I really just kind of grew up working in the business. Uh, even during high school, I was managing uh, restaurants and went to uh, Purdue uh, for college and restaurant hospitality management. Great school. And then eventually, I, I started dating who would be my wife, Dana, <laughs> and we went on a date to a winery in the Midwestern area here called Linford Winery, and it was during that date that uh, we had come up with the idea for a winery restaurant concept that we eventually called Cooper's Hawk. So um, I always tell people I'm I'm terrible at sports. All I really have done is work in my life. I've always enjoyed working and and definitely in the (laughs) restaurant and wine industry. It's a lot of fun working with all the great, fun, crazy people in the industry. Well, let's talk about that. I mean, a lot of people try and get into the wine industry, but not everybody is like you with uh, Cooper Hawk's 10-year anniversary. Now you have like over 1,100 employees. That's not a that's not an easy feat. You had retail operations of over $121 million in revenue. So how does someone like yourself build what you've built? Well, I think a lot of it is I, I was lucky to, to have the experience experience, you know, I hadn't had the experience of owning a business, but I had the experience of running restaurants and wineries. So that that gave me um, definitely a great start. I think so many people want to get into the business or get into any business, but they don't take the time to truly understand the business. You know, Malcolm Gladwell always talks about the uh, 10,000 hours in one of his books of really the requirement to, to be, you know, very successful in a certain business or industry. So, so thankfully I put the time in and then, uh, uh at the end of the day, we, we were committed to, to pulling it off. So I always tell people, you know, one of the most important, uh, keys to success is, as I call it, uh, just continuing to, to show up every day because it gets really hard and there's, there's a thousand reasons why we shouldn't be where we are today, but mm-hmm. we just kept showing up and giving it all we had and, Thankfully, finding a lot of wonderful people that would come on board and work with us to help create the company that we have today. 
I know it's amazing. So can you talk a little bit about your concept initially? You had started thinking putting a restaurant together with a winery, and this was quite new at the time. What was your inspiration for that? Yeah, well, really, you know, I had seen, well, everybody had seen, you know, all the brewery restaurants around the, the world. And um, I, uh, you know, again, going on that um, date and visit with my wife, I, mm-hmm. you know, we were at a winery having an, an experience and we were going to d- dinner afterwards. Mm-hmm. And I thought it was too bad that the winery didn't have a restaurant right there with it. It sounded like a great idea and would have been a lot of fun. So the next morning, I was on the Internet looking up winery restaurants and <laughs> I thought there'd be a million of them, just like the brew pubs. Uh-huh, but, but eventually it was, yeah, they, they just didn't really exist other than, you know, there was one Domaine Chandon in Napa Valley and another one in the Midwest. So so that really kind of gave us the inspiration for the idea. And mm-hmm. from there, it took about almost four and a half years to pull it off. We didn't have um, capital. We had to learn how to raise money and put together a business plan all while, you know, working a full 80-hour-a-week restaurant job. And at the time, you were only 20-some years old. How did you learn to raise capital? A lot of people, young people now starting businesses, and that's their biggest challenge. It is, yeah. I always say raising capital for the first location was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. It is uh, incredibly challenging. So what we did, um, you know, we I started putting together the business plan, and then I, ran, I, I found uh, these local community colleges in the Chicagoland area that have these small business development centers. So I would go there on my day off or if I had a morning off and would sit with a group of retired executives that would, you know, kind of hanging out, drinking coffee, just waiting for someone to show up so they can share their wisdom. And I would come and I would work the business plan and they would, you know, teach me how to, you know, well, this is how you'd you'd form an LLC and then Mm -hmm. you could do a private placement memorandum Mm -hmm. and you can have people invest, you know, X dollars per person. And then, you know, you can get an SBA bank loan like you do for your house. And Mm -hmm. so just over time, again, I just kept working it and working it. And um, again, incredibly difficult. But, you know, if you have a decent idea and and you're you're persistent, I, I think... There's a lot of people out there that have a lot of money to put to work, so it's you got to be a good salesman. <laughs> you have to be good at your craft too, which is what you are. Can you talk about the name? I mean, where did you come up with the name? Yeah, so so the name Cooper's Hawk. We, we were almost four years or three or four years into the planning, and, and the attorney was calling us and saying, "Listen, I you know if you really want to do this, you have to you have to give me a name. I have to go file the articles of incorporation <laughs> to kind of get it going." Right. So we. We had, my wife and I hadn't come up with a name that we agreed on, so I went to the library, and I got a book on birds, a book on rocks, on trees, geological terms, just just looking for something that kind of spoke uh, Napa-esque, per se. <laughs> and so while, while I was in the, the bird book, I saw a Cooper's hawk in the index, and immediately Cooper, uh, being someone who builds wine barrels, a cooperage, oh. um, came to mind, so... So that's really how um, how it came to be. I, I always wish I had a much more romantic, fun, dramatic story to tell, but uh, but that's how we came up with the name. Oh, I love that. That's great, and it's a great name. It's a nice, strong name. So talk Thank of you. oh no, please, and tell us about. Well, let's talk about your wine. What's your favorite wine that you make? Well, the guy who I grew up working for in the wine business always used to say, uh, you know, it's like asking me which one of my kids I like better, <laughs> um, but. But you know there, there's so many wines. Um, you know, we we make quite a few wines. We make 47 different wines, and then we also do 12 wine of the month. But if I had to pick one mm-hmm. at the moment that I'm drinking the most of, it's actually our our Cooper's Hawk Red, which is it's it's almost kind of a it's a less less expensive option of our wines. None of our wines are expensive, but. Um, but it's a blend of Cabernet Merlot and a little bit of Syrah, and you know, in that blend and the way, the way and style that we make it, is probably my most um, most enjoyable wine as at the moment. Oh wow! Well, my producer Susie here, she's like all smiles listening to you talk about wine. She's really <laughs> excited, and you've got 18 restaurants spread across the U.S. with four more coming. Yep. This year? Yep. Yeah, we have. Um, wow. We actually opened number nineteen just recently, so we have uh, two more coming this year, and then in two thousand and sixteen, we'll be opening up five more. So, so we'll have um, twenty one at the end of this year, and twenty six at the end of next year is our is our forecast for right now. Okay. How do you get any rest at all? You are you must be like the busiest man in Chicago. 
You know, I, I there there probably was a time I was the busiest man, but you know, people <laughs> always say, you know, now, you know, oh my God, you know, all this going on. This is actually the best, um, you know, from a life balance perspective that my life has been. Uh, you know, when you have, uh, you know, thankfully the 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 sales and um, success that we've had with with the restaurants and with the wine programs, you know, it, it's enabled us to bring in the best and brightest folks in the industry to help us run the company. So, so I've got a great team of people um, both here at the support center and in the winery, and also all of the operators out in the restaurants. That enables me to, you know, really focus on the future and how to not only continue growing the company, but, you know, our commitment is to make it uh, more innovative, more fun, and continuing <laughs> to improve the quality. So those are the kind of things I'm able to focus on every day. Well, let me ask you this. So, like, you basically, you talked really uh, briefly about your wine program. What's this wine program you discussed? So our wine club is uh, its definitely one of the most innovative parts of our business. So, you know, you're in California, so you're probably familiar with wine clubs uh, mm-hmm. out in wine country. Absolutely. The difference with our wine club is, um, you know, 97% of our membership are actually pickup members. So they come, you know, they come to the restaurants on oh. a monthly basis to pick up their wine. That's great. So, you know, it enables us to have a lower cost option because you don't have... Shipping costs, um, FedEx. All the shipping, yeah, the shipping yeah. Is, uh, so expensive for wine. So, uh, and, and and the other part is, as they're coming to pick up their wine, it enables people to come and have a uh, a delicious a, a, meal, a dinner, or have a glass of wine, and enjoy a drink with friends. So, so it's really been great. It's been um, a huge success for us, and and, and and the most fun part about it is this relationship that we have with our wine club members. So, you know, we really have you know an incredibly tight knit community of wine club members, uh, along, you know, that have relationships with our, with our staff. Okay. Well, Tim, talk. let's talk about this. I mean, in 2014, you won Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year at Midwest Awards. It's a big deal. So how are you, like when uh, we hear a lot of young people now starting businesses, and we hear a lot of talk about uh, Gen X and also the millennials, as a business owner from a, a, a more traditional industry, how do you keep relevant? Well, I mean, you have to uh, you have to focus on, on, on staying innovative. And, you know, the, the most important thing, the, the foundation has to be there. So you have to have, you know, great people that you work with that help mm-hmm. support, you know, the day-to-day business. Um, but, but you have to be committed to quality. So, you know, quality will never go out of style. So exactly. you know, before we even speak about innovation, we, uh-huh. you know, we ensure that our food is great, our wine is great, it's relevant. Um, you know, we have a blend of, you know, kind of, uh, you know, just – right down the fairway dishes, mm-hmm. but then we also have dishes and wines that are a little bit more, you know, a little more modern, a little bit more forward-looking. A little bit more hip. So we try to keep a blend of, of op- options to, you know, really to have something that appeals to everyone, whether you're a no- novice wine consumer, you know, a regular, you know, wine consumer that has a glass of wine every day, or, you know, a kind of sewer that really appreciates, you know, the finer wines in the world. So we try to have something for everyone. But it is you have to uh, you have to stay close to your business and you have to look around and see what other um, not only restaurant and wineries are doing but what else is happening in other industries such as you know some of the lifestyle brands of the world that are doing incredible things. Yeah, so true. So Cooper's Hawk, um, what can you maybe tell me what is the most popular dish that people order when they come to your restaurants? Um, there's a, c- a couple, you know, it varies a little bit location by location, but, mm-hmm. you know, one of the, uh, we definitely sell uh, quite a few steaks. So <laughs> even though we're, um, you know, not one of the greatest pairings, but, uh, we have, uh, in the Chicagoland area, we have a dish, uh, chicken jardinera. Oh, that, that sounds so incredibly, good. It's so good. Yeah, it's so good. And, um, another one is we do a gnocchi carbonara, which is, uh, these, these handmade gnocchis from oh, the wow. family here in Chicago that we get out to all the restaurants and um, just in this incredible flavored sauce. It's, um, it might not be the healthiest thing in our menu, but it's really, really good. And it goes well with wine, I'm sure. Yes. Everything goes good with wine Yay. nowadays. <laughs> That's so true. So where most of your, you, I mean, they're spread about 22 locations. But I would say where are most of your restaurants? Are they spread all over in different states or? Yeah, yeah. Well, we're in, in seven states total. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the majority are focused in the Midwest. We have seven in the Chicagoland area, but then throughout the Midwest, such as Kansas City, St. Louis, Milwaukee, those kind of markets. Mm-hmm. And then we're in Florida. We've got three locations in Florida and three more to come soon. 
and we're also in Richmond, Virginia, um, and so we have more Virginia kind of D.C. markets uh, coming soon as well. I can see this concept is just amazing in Texas, too. Maybe yeah, no, we're excited to get there one day. Texas, you know, eventually moving west, but right now we're trying to, you know, be smart about our growth and, and make sure we open in the right spots as we continue to um, grow our brand. We want to make sure we're thoughtful and don't get uh, too over our skis. Yeah, that's smart, Tim. So let me ask you, Tim. So, you know, obviously you've had a lot of success. Let's talk about like how, what, like who would you credit to some of the business sense that you've had? Did your parents teach you or this is something you learned in school? Yeah, no, I mean, definitely I had, um, you know, some family influence. You know, my dad, you know, you know, worked in small business, you know, his whole life. So, you know, being around him, I learned a lot. Um, my mom, you know, uh, although we didn't have, you know, really any money growing up, my mom always, you know, would, instead of going out to dinner once a month at, you know, some average restaurant, she would take us out somewhere really special once a year to have kind of a really unique experience. I, I you know, I'll never forget. We went to the, um, Sunday brunch at the four seasons in Chicago when I was oh, 15 wow. and, you know, and having not really, I don't even, I hadn't even been to Chili's yet, you know, and we went, <laughs> we went there. And so you're, so cool. you know, some of those, those, uh, experiences leave a mark, you know, right. and you remember those things. Cause she was smart. And then smart. also I had, uh, some other, um, Aunt and uncles that had uh, were kind of entrepreneurial folks, so kind of growing up and seeing some of that, I always had an affinity for small business and working and such. Yeah, that's incredible because your mom taught you at a very young age importance of budgeting because she basically didn't take you to just everywhere, but you saved up for something special at the Four Seasons. That's I love right. That. Yeah, great. Well, I know you're a dad now. I mean, what lesson do you do you have for your children or for your child? Yeah, well, I'm definitely not doing a very good job of teaching them how to budget right now. They're like spoiled rotten. But uh, it, so they're, um, you know, I, I try to, I'm excited. to. I, I'm not going to get them started working when they're 11 years old like I did. I, I don't, that's probably not the healthiest of things. But mm-hmm. but I am excited to see them. They're very energetic kids. They're they're very good kids. And, you know, in my, I, I just try to teach them some of the, the fundamentals of, you know, treating people well. And, you know, one of my favorite things is every time we visit one of the restaurants for dinner with our family, you know, we've never left without me taking the two of them in the kitchen and, you know, saying hi to all the workers and all the, I mean, cause you know, you've probably seen the back of a kitchen uh, at a commercial restaurant. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's a tough job. It people is. are really working hard. It's so hot really hopefully hours. just teaching them, uh, you know, a level of appreciation for how hard people work and how lucky we are. And, um, and I thoroughly intend to put them to work at a very young age. It'll be good for them. Oh, that's good. Yeah, you know, I just, on my drive here, Susie, my producer, she shared with me something that her and her husband did, which I just love, which is kind of a similar concept. She says, you know, they, you know, academically, actually, I want them to do well. But she says, the most important thing that I wanted my kids to know is to always be good pe- people, 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 you know, to be good right. to other people and take good care of other people and be really respectful and kind so you can take them everywhere. And I was like, okay, I love it. This is great because my kids are only six and under, and these are the lessons that you learn along the way from parents who have lived it and who, who raise really wonderful children that they can be proud of. Let me ask you this, Tim. I'm curious. So, you know, obviously you have a, you've had a lot of success in life, and I, I always like to ask this question, especially when we do these sort of interviews. When you had your true real check, like one check came in, and it was of a decent amount, right, and you felt that was a check that you could take home to your parents to show, look at mom and dad, look at, I'm going to be okay. What did you do with your first check. Did you buy anything interesting? The um, well, you're right about that experience. It is very memorable. Um, uh, the the one thing that we did buy is we we decided to build. Um, we didn't do it in the first five minutes, but we we ultimately decided to build a, a home that you know was kind of custom fit our family. Because mm-hmm. I, I I've always thought you know of anything that we could have or anything that we could buy or you know, to have the place that you spend, you know, outside of your office, you know, the majority amount of time in a mm-hmm. home that our kids can grow up in and, and hopefully never want to leave. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so that was probably the most important thing that we did. And, and I, you know, every day I pull up to it, you know, as I'm, as I'm getting home, I, I can't even believe that we're lucky enough to live in a Aww. house like we live in. So it's, uh, it's not a house, yeah, it's a home. I think, and I think it's, um, I don't know if it's a good investment or not, but uh, we sure have a whole bunch of fun uh, grilling out and having having all of our friends and coworkers over. That's the best investment, absolutely. 
It's an investment in yourself. So amazing. Well, with that, thank you so much, Tim, for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. I've learned so much from you in this short amount of time. And I can't wait to the day I can actually go to Chicago and eat at one of your restaurants and most importantly, meet you. Because you have yeah no well thanks for having me it was a pleasure spending time with you and uh, yes we were gonna drag you out here you're gonna you're gonna love it oh it won't be too much dragging trust me I will be there well <laughs> let me ask you this Tim we we all want to stay in contact with you and follow um, the next growth that you have how can everybody stay in contact connecting with you social media. Yeah, absolutely. Social media, we have, you know, I think all the, the traditional um, aspects from Facebook, Instagram, et cetera. Mm-hmm. You know, we've got our website. And so those of you who are listening, you can follow me at Sun Group WP, and I'll make sure that all um, Tim's social media postings are on, listed on the, the website as well, and we'll make sure to connect back and forth and forth in, in, in every single direction. So don't you worry. And with that, thank you so much, Tim, for being on the show. And um, you can follow me on Twitter, like I said, at Sun Group WP. Until next time, we will be talking. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.